us. There we go. So the topic at hand, um, Pope Francis has declared this a liturgical year as a year placed specially in the care of St. Joseph. Um, and the natural question which comes with this statement is why? Uh, why St. Joseph? Why St. Joseph in particular? Uh, and so we need to figure out what we need to incorporate from the life of St. Joseph into our own lives. So what do we know about St. Joseph then so that we can incorporate this? Well, to answer that question, honestly, not much. Uh, mo most of what we know from St. Joseph comes from scripture. Uh, there are many pious legends which surround him, um, but they are honestly questionable uh, at best as far as the historicity goes. Um, there have been a few mystics that have had private revelation, visions of St. Joseph or visions of Mary where she talks about St. Joseph. Um, but again, these are private revelation. They're not required to be believed by the faithful. So what we have to go on is what's on the surface, right? And what scripture tells us is that he's a just man, that he was Mary's spouse. He was a carpenter. Um, and he had dreams in which angels spoke to him. Um, and he followed what they told him to do. That's pretty much all scripture says specifically about him. He never talks, he's always in the shadows. So again, why him in particular? To understand this choice, it goes back to the understanding that there's more to St. Joseph than merely what meets the eye. I'm sorry, can everyone else hear me? Okay, um, I'm sorry, CC, I, I'm not sure what the, what the problem uh, is. So to understand uh, the choice for why they selected, why Pope Francis selected St. Joseph in particular is to understand the key phrase, he was a just man. There are only a handful of men throughout the entire Bible that hold the title, a just man. And what it tells us is that he was aligned very, very closely to God. He was always ready to do his will, always living his life out for God. And frankly, this is what we're called to do. Uh, as disciples of Christ, that's what we're called to do. Um, so for this purpose, the church holds up Joseph as a prime example of the one that we're supposed to imitate on our path to God, and hence the title of this series, The Imitation of St. Joseph. St. Joseph, in a very special way, shows us these virtues to emulate. But as I said, we have very little stated solely about Joseph in scripture and none of his words. How can we imitate someone that we hardly even know? And I would contend that we actually do know him. The answer to who Joseph is, is found in his actions and in particular in what goes unsaid in scripture. And we'll learn some more about that in the world which surrounds him. This particular talk this evening revolves around his virtues of humility, obedience, and courage. And one of the things that you'll find about these virtues is they all interweave together. Uh, all of the virtues do. So if you notice a trend throughout these talks, it's because the trend is actually there. Um, all of the virtues are dependent on each other and they all strengthen each other. You can't truly be courageous and have no humility it doesn't work. Um, but I'll get more into the inner workings of the virtues later. Um, but just so that you're aware, they'll, they'll keep coming back. So keep those in mind. Whenever you think about St. Joseph, two images come to mind, and both of them are generally uh, found revolving around the, the uh, nativity. The first one is an old gray beard leaning on a staff, looking down at young Mary holding the baby Jesus. The other one is a young man who's a, a young man in his prime, working in a workshop, finishing whatever carpentry commission he's been given with the little boy Jesus either playing nearby or helping him. And both images may be true. Scripture doesn't tell us how old Joseph was when he married Mary, but a reflection on the reasons why he's portrayed this way may give us a little more insight into the virtues of St. Joseph. The old man Joseph is primarily a product of the early church fathers, uh, specifically the proto-evangelium the proto of James. Um, and 
the main thought was to protect the perpetual virginity of Mary and the virgin birth of Jesus. Joseph would have been there primarily as a protector for Mary who had sworn herself to virginity, um, in which you know, this is comes a lot from scripture from that phrase, I know not man. That phrase in the particular Greek that it was written in implies much more than simply haven't been intimate yet. It implies both a past, present, and current connotation. So continuous throughout time. So that's where this idea of a vow of virginity for Mary comes from. Um, but with that, she wouldn't have even had the protections under the law that widows had. Um, so she wouldn't have had the protection of a husband, wouldn't have had the protection of the widows. So here you have this older Joseph being present as the protector of Mary. The other one, though, is the young Joseph. Um, as a man in his prime, sometime, you know, 18 to 20 when he would have married Mary. Um, he would have then entered into this marriage fully knowing of this vow of continence that they would be living out. Um, and this would have been known at least to their parents. Um, honestly, I find this one having quite a bit of merit uh, whenever you consider everything that Joseph had to do uh, in his time as the protector and provider for the Holy Family. Um, the first thing that I look at is his travels. Um, he has to flee with his pregnant wife 300 or so miles on foot to Egypt, take those 300 miles back uh, after Herod dies, and make all the repeated trips to uh, Jerusalem that are required by law. And uh, in the words of Mother Angelica, <laughs> old men don't walk to Egypt. Um, so in addition to this, he also would have had to have been their protector along those journeys. This was not a safe uh, time to travel. You had both the natural dangers, um, you know, the, the wild animals and the like, and also the uh, man-made ones. Uh, banditry was not uncommon. And so Joseph would have been the protector of the God-man and the mother of God. Um, so that's having a younger Joseph would uh, make a little more sense in those, in that light. And also carpentry is not a light job. It would have been very physically demanding at the time. Now, whichever one is there, has the church made a definitive statement on this? No, not at all. Uh, you can believe whichever one you want to believe. I do think though that in addition to making a little more sense, the young man Joseph allows his virtue to shine through all the brighter. Um, so I'll be using this one for most of my explanations. It makes sense either way uh, for the points for old man, young man. It's just, it's makes the virtue a little more uh, emphasized whenever you take him as a young man in his prime. So all of this time, and I haven't even talked about the virtues yet. So here we go. Humility, St. Joseph was a humble man. To understand that statement properly, you have to properly understand humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Um, and frankly, even the phrase, you know, the, the phrase, quote, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking about yourself less, that's not necessarily correct either, it's, though it is more to the spirit. Humility is the proper ordering of self in relation to God and others. And this is what I mean. There is no shame in me acknowledging that Father Mark was smarter than I am. Um, there's no shame in me acknowledging that uh, Michael Jordan is more athletic than I am. There's no pride in acknowledging that, you know, that there's no pride for Father Mark to, to know that he's smarter than I am. You know, it's, these are all gifts, though, that God has poured out in his abundant generosity. And the problem comes in when you try to attribute the source to yourself and not to God. The problem comes in whenever you try to assume that, you know, whenever, if, if I were to say, well, I have a greater dignity and worth because I am more athletic than this other person, that, that's pride. Um, so it, humility is the right ordering of self in relation to God 
where you understand that you are a creature sustained in existence due to his infinite love with salvation offered to you through no merits of your own. Whenever, whenever I finally realize that, whenever I finally live that, that is humility. And we're called to submit then in that humility, in trust to the God who loves us. That's the right ordering of the universe. The, the phrase that I love for it is God is God and I am not. So how does this apply to St. Joseph? Well, the first example comes in whenever we're introduced to him in Matthew's gospel. Joseph was betrothed to Mary. She was found with child and he chooses to divorce her quietly. There are three theories for why he chose to divorce Mary quietly, and each one comes with its own understanding of humility. Um, the first thought, the first theory, is that Joseph thought that Mary was in fact unfaithful. She was pregnant and it wasn't his. Um, two and two make four. The second theory is that he had no idea what was going on. Um, he, he grew up with her. That, you know, and that's the thing about Nazareth. Nazareth is not a big town at this point. It's only been around for a couple of generations. And so he would have grown up with Mary. He would have knew her. You know, she was perfect. So, I mean, that it, this would have gone against everything that he would have known about her. You know, he knew that she wouldn't have betrayed God and him in that way. But she was pregnant and not with his child, so she was actually subject to legal penalties. So he sought to protect Mary as much as he could and fulfill the law, being the just man, by divorcing her quietly. The third theory is that Joseph knew exactly what was going on. You know, again, this in Nazareth, it was founded by those in the house of David. They knew their genealogies. They were looking at the signs of the times. They were expecting the Messiah to be born soon. Um, you know, the, then there's also the prophecy about the Messiah being born of a virgin. And here we have the Virgin Mary conceiving a child. You know, this, this starts to, to add together, you know, maybe this is the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah that we've been waiting for. Um, also, one of the things that I was looking at was it might seem a little bit weird for Mary to keep the Annunciation from her spouse. Um, but again, that's just my own theory. Anyways, according to this third idea, Joseph felt unworthy to be called the to be called father by the savior of mankind. So what he was going to do was he was going to protect Mary's secret and then make a quiet exit remove himself from the stage. Um, after all, this is the son of God. God would protect them. The church has no official teaching on this. Um, you'll hear that line again and again from me. Um, believe whichever one makes sense. I myself tend more towards the second theory, but again, that's just myself. Each of these three theories, though, drives to a different element of humility in the beginning before he had the dream uh, where, in which the angel appears, and then after the angel appears. So if he thought that she was unfaithful, the penalty for that would have been stoning, stoning her to death. If he had actually uh, pushed through the whole way with you know, everything and, and exposed her uh, as being unfaithful. Um, instead, he swallows his pride and doesn't seek the penalty out according to the law that she would have received. Instead, in his humility, if he thought that she was unfaithful, he still sought to protect her. Instead of, um, instead of getting his own vengeance. Um, if he was simply confused, the second theory, this perplexity theory, he still would have appeared, you know, as I said, this vow of continence entering into this, this marriage with this vow of continence with his wife, it would have looked like he broke that vow. And this would have been known at least to their parents. So he has to swallow his pride. He has to deal with appearing like he, he broke a vow and led his wife into breaking that vow too. Um, and the third theory, it actually drives humility further for it. It looks like he broke that vow, but 
but then he also rightly acknowledges that he has no right to be the father of this of this messiah of this god man the fact that he would have authority over god himself as he raises christ in his human nature and i'll get more into that in a little bit but after the angel appears he expresses his humility all over again and in different lights so you know as i said it's it's a lot of this swallowing his own pride he's willing to sacrifice his good name for love of god and love of his spouse he's willing to undergo shame to protect the one that he loves he's willing to let go of his doubts the things that he thinks are certain all of it so as to follow god in a more deep and true way he sees his life as a life lived in service in humility to god and in such lives that same service and humility for his spouse and he does it again whenever he's told to flee to egypt he doesn't hesitate he doesn't complain he doesn't ask for he doesn't ask god for promises of prosperity or even safety at the other end he acts completely out of humility acknowledging the divine rulership of god and it manifests itself as trusting obedience trusting that god is in fact god you know you'll find this uh in contradiction with jacob whenever he's, uh, after he's fled Esau, uh, so Jacob, the son of, um, oh, this is embarrassing. Anyways, uh, Jacob, whenever he's fleeing Esau, he, uh, <laughs> whenever God tells him to go to this land that I will show you, he says, you know, and, and I will be your God, you will be my people and I will be your God. And his, and Jacob's response, thank you, Father, and Jacob's response is, well, if you take care of me and if you give me uh, a, a safe place to go to and if there's food there and if I can make a living and then you will be my God. Joseph doesn't do that. Joseph has the humility to trust that God is God and he'll take care of him. And yes, there's reason and rationality there too. I mean consider it herod's trying to kill jesus and likely mary and joseph for harboring him you know i'm not advocating you know listening to little voices inside of your head and we'll get more into intelligent obedience in the next section but god's will comes to us in so many many different ways through prayer through circumstances in life through the guidance of his church and it all comes down to if we're willing to acknowledge that we are not the ultimate authority. It comes down to if I, you know, if I am, if I finally acknowledge that I am not the, the ultimate arbiter of right and wrong, I'm not the arbiter of the way that my life should or should not go. I need to acknowledge that God is the one who holds me in the palm of his hand and will take care of me, regardless of how that looks in my life, and have the humility to acknowledge that. So that's humility and how Joseph plays into it. I figured to give a brief chance here uh, for any questions before anyone forgot them. Uh, anyone have anything? Tom, this is Father Mark. Yes, Father. How you doing? Doing well yourself. I'm doing well, thank you. Hey, I just thought, and maybe I missed it. You may want to explain a little bit about what you meant by continents to folks. They might be thinking that has to do with a bowel movement. So you might want to ah, explain okay. a little bit about that to folks. Sure. Uh, to live in continents and marriages, to uh, live without the marital embrace, without, without uh, the sexual encounter. Um, so it's to live in a state of... Um, Yeah, where where you're where you're not engaging in the marital embrace. That was a very delicate way of putting it. <laughs> All right. Uh, does anyone have anything else? All right. So we touched on humility. 
<clears throat> the governing mindset, which acknowledges that God is God and I am not, uh, which sees the inherent dignity and worth of every human being, but at the same time does not denigrate my worth and dignity. As humility grows in the heart, obedience naturally flowers forth from it. So I guess the next question is, what is obedience? Um, obedience is not blind and thoughtless, and it is certainly not contingent on my wishes or demands. I'm not obedient whenever I want to be obedient and then not obedient whenever I don't want to be, whenever it gets in my way. Um, obedience properly understood is the virtue of complying intelligently with the will of my superior so long as it is not a moral evil. And the term superior here simply means the individual who has authority. Uh, for children, it would be parents. Um, for me, it would be the rector of the seminary and then the bishop, of course. Um, you know, for Father Mark, it would be the bishop. Um, and I, I can remember one of the clearest statements on obedience came from my sister, actually, uh, which is obedience is prompt, joyful, and complete. Um, so it is done promptly, it is done with a joyful heart, and it is done completely to the best of my abilities. So how does St. Joseph model this intelligent complying with the will of his superiors? And so it's fairly obvious how he does this with God and the religious superiors at the time. But another point that I also wanted to bring up was his obedience to the secular authorities of his day. And I'll start with obedience to God because God always comes first. Uh, the first example I'd like to pull from is, again, going back to that first dream where the angel tells Joseph to take Mary into his home. God sends an angel to speak to him in his dream telling him Mary is conceived by the Holy Spirit and that he is to take Mary into his home. I've already talked about Joseph's humility in this regard. He already acknowledged God is God and God gave him an express statement of what his will is. And it's more than simply not divorcing Mary. One of the biggest things here and one of the things that I have utmost respect for Joseph on this regard is it completely upset the plans that Joseph had made for himself. He and Mary were going to live in this continent marriage, uh, quietly, under the radar, not grabbing the attention of a king who was slowly descending into paranoid madness himself. That, that would be Herod. Um, here, he would be pushed forward, not just into raising a child which wasn't his own biological son, but he's raising the Messiah which was going to redeem all of Israel, who had been foretold of from the time of Moses. He was to raise a child, the son of God, the God-man, and he was supposed to have author the authority of a father over him. Consider that. He was supposed to be dad for the God of the universe who had taken this human nature to himself. The human nature of Christ had to be taught and raised by Mary and Joseph, given a father's example by Joseph, right? No pressure, right? <laughs> he had to let go of all of his plans so as to be obedient to God. Joseph would have known that Jesus was the foretold Messiah. You know, I, I had mentioned that a little bit before. This would have put them all on a collision course with Herod. And that goes straight into the second example. They had the heir to the line of David growing in the womb of Mary, and this put them in great danger. And that leads them to the flight into Egypt. All God told him to do was to flee to Egypt. As I mentioned before, there was no safety net. There was no uh, unemployment, no, no benefits in Egypt at the time. Um, no promise of a job on the other end. No promise of any comfort or safety on the road, especially whenever I had mentioned the roads were dangerous to travel. It's a flight from danger into another. Uh, a flight from deadly peril into deadly peril. Um, but he did it. He was humble enough to realize, again, I, I, I hammered this point earlier, he was humble enough to realize that God was God and God would see him through whatever was coming. And that's what gave him the, the strength to obey. 
but he did so intelligently. It wasn't simply, all right, Mary, hop on the donkey and let's go to Egypt. They were fleeing a mad king. They were fleeing Herod, who I mentioned you know, before. He, he was a, a paranoid madman. <laughs> Herod himself was extremely skilled in two particular places. He was an amazing builder and architect, and he was also extremely skilled in what I've heard called institutional terror. Basically think the Gestapo, spies and informants wherever he could plant them. Joseph had to intelligently think of how he was going to get them out of town and away from Herod's reach as soon as possible, as quietly as he could. God didn't tell him how. He told him do. And he left it to Joseph's natural gifts, that intelligent uh, brain that he planted inside of him. So that's, again, I had mentioned before, it's not doing so thoughtlessly, it's done intelligently. And obedience to God is one thing, right? He's God. Obedience to his church is one thing. It's the church that he founded. Obedience to a secular authority, though, is something that we both take for granted and resent at the same time in the United States. Obedience is a part of life, but frankly, it shouldn't simply be because we're afraid of being thrown in jail. We have an obligation of obedience to our secular authorities as they are the ones that God has permitted to be placed in positions of power. Now I say that, but it's only up to a point. We are not bound by obedience to do matters which are evil. This is the concept of the just law theory. We are bound to follow just laws, but obligated not not just not just permitted but obligated to disobey and oppose unjust laws so for example if the state required you to hand over all of your sons under the age of 2 so that they could be killed you would in fact have an obligation to resist and disobey that law as joseph did you can be sure joseph paid his taxes he took his wife with him whenever he was ordered by the state to participate in the census in matters of just laws, he obeyed. However, whenever the state overreached and entered into mandating evil actions, Joseph disobeyed and was right to do so. So to sum up, Joseph was obedient to his legitimate superiors, religious and secular, obedient to the point of loss of reputation, loss of material goods, even the potential loss of life. His life was forfeit for what he did with Jesus. But he obeyed promptly, joyfully, and completely using the intelligence and gifts that were given to him by God. Why? Because he loved God and sought to serve him and those that were set over him. And that's the same thing that we're called to do and for the same reason. You can see how this comes out of humility. It's a proper ordering of self to God and to others. And from that flows this obedience. So that's obedience. Courage, on the other hand, the next one that I'm getting into, that is a virtue that Joseph had extensively. Courage, like almost all of the virtues, is found as a mean between two extremes. On one side, you have cowardice. On the other side, you have recklessness. It's not an emotion, but is rather tied to action. The best definition of courage that I have heard is doing what is right because it's right, because it needs to be done. And St. Joseph does this again and again and again, all the time. It's tied intimately, though, with his humility and his obedience. And that's why I'm covering it last. In order to obey, you need to choose to obey, to will it. In order to will to obey, you need to have the courage to will to obey. And that comes directly from the idea of where you stand in respect to God and others. If God tells you to do something and you actually hold him to be God, and that's the humility, then you can have the courage to do anything because he's got your back. Joseph takes Mary into his home. He can live with the humiliation because he's humble enough to accept the courage from God so as to obey him. 
He flees to Egypt because he's humble enough to trust that God has his back. And when he's ordered to return, he does so promptly without demanding promises or explanations. Was he scared during each of these episodes? I am darn sure he was terrified. I mean, imagine, if you will, you were informed that the CIA is coming to kill you and your family, and you need to flee to Mexico to be safe fish. You have little time to pack, little ability to take goods with you. You have no family or kin where you're going, and you don't know what you're going to find on the road or what you're going to find on the other end. All you know is that you need to get out of Dodge fast and not get caught. Would you be scared? St. Joseph shows us that courage isn't a feeling then. It's perfectly, it's perfectly coherent to say that someone was both terrified and courageous in the same exact moment. One of the examples I love, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Hacksaw Ridge, but Dawson was terrified as he went to go get just one more wounded soldier. It's the same thing with St. Joseph. This is the courage that we've been building to for this entire talk. Humility breeds obedience, which then breeds courage. Courage in a like manner feeds back into obedience, which reinforces humility. This chain constantly reinforces each other. It, it, the, you always get the virtues building on each other, reinforcing them, this upward spiral towards God. And you know, as, as we continue through this series, I'll, I'll keep uh, tying each of the virtues in as we go. So at the end, what do we have? What vision do we have of the just man? Well, he's a humble man. He's willing to obey God and his superiors, to live for the greater glory of God. He's willing to go up against worldly powers for the love of his God and family. He's willing to undergo fear, uncertainty, pain, anguish, all for love of God and his family. And frankly, this is what we're called to do. This is the example we're supposed to imitate. It looks differently for each person, for each state in life. I know I've given some broad brushes, you know, of, of uh, some theoretical stuff of what it means. It's different for each state in life. So it's going to be, you know, it, but the example of St. Joseph makes it clear that we're supposed to live a life lived for God. And that means that we live a life for those who are placed in our care. For those who are married, it means that you pour out your life, you give your life for your kids and for your spouse. That's your number one priority. You come last. My call is to live my life out, to pour it out for my brother seminarians, for everyone that I come in contact with in the parishes, um, for the faculty, for my bishop. It's to live my life for all of these people and myself comes last. Um, father is to pour his life forth for the parish and for the diocese. That's what he lives his life for. But it's all done because it's properly ordered to God. It's not just done because that's what the right thing to do is. It's done because it's properly ordered to God, acknowledging God as God, and living the obedience which demands that pouring forth of life promptly, joyfully, and completely, and intelligently for our superiors, done courageously, doing what is right for love of God and neighbor. And this is how all of it pulls together. This is what St. Joseph tells us, shows us lived his life out for the Holy Family. And God asks nothing more from us. He also doesn't ask anything less of us. But the thing is, he's always willing to help. And frankly, so is St. Joseph. So let's pray and ask for his intercession. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, O blessed St. Joseph, as once you rescued the child Jesus from deadly peril, so now protect God's holy church from the snares of the enemy and from all adversity. Shield to each one of us by your constant protection, so that supported by your example and your aid, we may be able to live piously, to die in holiness, and to obtain eternal happiness in heaven. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Any questions here at the end?
What were you going to say? Go ahead. What? Go ahead. Uh, uh, you said earlier that uh, men don't travel back then. What do you mean by that? How did he take her to Bethlehem if men don't travel? Uh, the, the, the phrase was, uh, old men don't walk to Egypt. Oh, okay. Um, and so the, the trip to Egypt would have been 300 miles, which may have on foot which would have been extremely difficult for one who was advanced in age. But uh, back then, uh, is it not true that the men rode uh, an animal and the women and children walked behind? I have not heard that. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not uh, extremely well educated on that topic. <laughs> so. That's probably why uh, he gave up his ride to let Mary ride the donkey because he knew she couldn't walk it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't heard that, but yeah, that if that was the case, then that would make sense. Yeah. And then when uh, they were on their way back home and uh, Jesus was lost, they said Mary was walking with the women. So that could have meant that the men were up front on their animals looking out for any predators. That is certainly a possibility, yes. OK. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Your dad was a great talk. I, I enjoyed that. I remember one of our old parishioners. She's passed away now, Kathy Keverline. St. Joseph was her most precious person. And she'd say to us all the time when we'd dust him off, that, you know, poor St. Joseph, nobody pays any attention to him. He's just all alone out there. And I kind of had to smile a few times when you were talking. Very good, Tom, very good. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It was very interesting. Thank you. Anyone else have, uh, have anything? All right. Well, I appreciate your time and uh, have a wonderful evening to you all. And hopefully we'll see you uh, next week. Uh, we'll be going over, oh goodness, which one will we be going over? Uh, St. Joseph, silent, patient, and trusting. So hopefully we'll see you all then. Thank you again for your time.